cool. Um, so hi everybody for those here and those watching later. Um, today we've got Zane. I've never said Zane's last name. Now that is a Zane Afsal. Yeah. You? There you go. Um, Zane Afsal, who's a UNSW grad alum, current employee at Google, um, someone who was fairly instrumental in getting this course off the ground. And uh, we invite Zane along to talk to you and share some thoughts for an hour um, on some stuff around web dev and dev tools. I'll, I won't summarize it because I'll get it wrong, but I'm pretty much just going to loiter in the background for the next hour while Zane kind of takes over and gives you an opportunity to, you know, listen to some of his thoughts and ask some questions. And then at the end of that time, when Zane's wrapped up, um, any of the time we have left, I'm happy to answer and um, field some questions around um, the assignment, if there's any, otherwise we can finish up early. So other than that, I'll hand over to Zane. Um, can you give uh, share screen permission to lowercase Zane, not uppercase Zane? Done. You both, both, both upper and lowercase Zane have it now. Beautiful. All right, share screen, Google Chrome. Oh, maybe I'll just do screen. Okay, cool. So um, I have chat open. So if you want to like ask questions on chat um, to like the 10 of us that are here, feel free to. Uh, cool. Okay, so I'm Zane. I am, I'm currently a software engineer at Google. I've been there for like almost three years now, so not too long. Um, but uh, I am going to give a lecture on mostly dev tools. And I think originally this lecture was mostly focused on networking. So I like a lot of it you'll find is how to work with um, the network tab in dev tools. But um, I realized that uh, there's also some other stuff I can sneak in. So I also talk a little bit about other stuff dev tools can do. Yeah, so um, ask questions at will, um, uh, interrupt me, I'm happy to be interrupted. So first of all, I have a website in front of you. It's called Classroom. It's an amazing website. It makes me billions of dollars a year. Um, but if I refresh it, you'll see that it loads for a very long time. This is much too long. There's that old study that says that I think if a website takes more than like, I don't know, two seconds to load, people just click off of it. So we can't have that. We want to make a billion dollars. So we start off by... Uh, opening up the network tab. Now, when you open up the network tab on DevTools, um, oh, actually, maybe I should start off with, I did right click inspect to open DevTools. That's just like a fast way. You could also open it via the three dot menu. I think it's more tools, developer tools. Um, or you can see the little shortcut there on a Mac, it's shift command I. Um, I think it's like control shift I on a like a non Mac keyboard. But I've opened it up and I've opened up this little network tab. Um, and you'll see that there's nothing there because it actually doesn't start recording your network activity until you open the tab. Um, for no other reason than it's a little bit, it's cost, it's costly to sort of run and sort of intercept all the network requests. So it only does it if you ask it to. But now if I refresh, you'll see that I get a whole bunch of fun stuff. Um, overview, I mean, again, like all of this stuff can be more, like you can read up on it in more detail if you like look up the docs, but Name is sort of the name of the resource that's been requested. Generally speaking, it's the last bit of the URL. So you can see here, this says one, but it's actually requesting localhost API marks exam one. Um, this is requesting students.json, but from a much bigger URL. Um, and status tells you the status um, of the request. Type tells you where it was requested from. Script actually means that it was, um, this is a resource that was requested by the operating, sorry by the browser when it hit a script tag. Style sheet, you know, same thing with the link tag. Um, font, um, same thing. Uh, and then fetch kind of gives you a hint that this was sort of requested by code. Um, initiator will try and give you um, where the resource was requested from. You can see for these ones, it just links to the HTML file because it's just a script tag. Um, but, you know, these ones sort of give you files where they were called from, index, index, et cetera you know, size, time, waterfall. So the waterfall is what we're curious about here because you can see uh, requesting this resource took, you know, one second, this took one second, and then this took three seconds. So clearly this is probably holding up our loading page. So I can click on it and it gives me a whole bunch of information. Um, so I actually don't know if in this course we, yes, William, you've picked up on a, on a bug that we will get to later, but we can ignore that for now. Um, so I imagine in this course, we've gone through like the basics of HTTP. Um, so hopefully sort of response headers and request headers aren't too foreign, um, but that's all the information. It gives you a bunch of everything, basically the browser added onto the request as well, um, as, well as, as well as stuff that you've um, 
explicitly put into the response from your server. Now, API mocks as one, or assignment one, uh, is the issue is taking way too long. Um, now, in this situation, let's say you can't fix the server. I can show you the server and show that what I've done is just made it wait for three seconds before responding. Um, so, you know, billion dollar product. But um, if you didn't have that option, um, you could also do some other stuff to fix it up. Uh, if I look at the network of the waterfall, you can see something particular here. We request one resource, then the next, then the third resource in sequence. And you can see that because of the waterfall um, rectangles are offset. Um, does anyone want to guess in chat what the, the right way to make this faster would be? What's an acceptable amount of time to wait before I give up? Oh, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's no need that, well, we're assuming that there's no need that we need to request these in sequence. We can just request them all at the start and then they'll get back to us at some point. So if I go into the index code, uh, index. I can't see the top of VS code because Zoom has this like annoying thing. Um, and I'm not, I'm not plugging. Google Meet doesn't do this. I'm, I'm just saying. Um, so you can see here in the index JavaScript file, I believe it's right around about here. So we take um, a data URL from this uh, object and we request it and we wait for it to be done here before we continue. So the easiest way to get rid of this is to say, all right, I'm not going to wait for each promise individually. I'm going to go promises is a new array. Promises dot push this thing. Um, again, remember dot then just returns a promise so you can create this chain and just add the promise at the end um, to your list. And then I can just go await promise dot all promises. Okay. Let's see if this made a noticeable difference. Uh, cool, it's clear on network. You can do that via this little thing, clear. I wonder if there's a keyboard shortcut. I don't know, but I just clicked the button. Refresh, all right. So immediately you, you can see that that now put them all into um, not sequence, whatever the opposite is, they're all in line. So uh, it still took three seconds, but you can notice it actually, um, it loaded two seconds faster because we weren't doing two seconds of loading than the last three seconds. We're now just limited by our slowest step, which is a lot better. Um, and again, you can see like proof that that's sort of what's happening. All right, cool. Now let's go a little bit down and look at the October atten attendance graph. It's not there. What sort of billion dollar product is this? So um, someone pointed out already, I think it was William, that there's a little um, issue here. It says orc 400 bad request. Um, so let's say, um, you know, for whatever reason, I assume that that is the correct URL. Um, how do I figure out what the issue is, right? 400 bad request is a very generic error, right? It just tells me that the server had decided that I made the wrong request, but I don't have any more details. A lot of the time though, um, and you can find it here as well, it's highlighted red because it failed uh, with the 400. Um, a lot of the time though, your server, when you make an invalid request, will try and give you a hint on why it was invalid. Um, I mean, not all servers will do this. If you're not working with an API that's intended to be worked with directly, then you won't get this. But generally speaking, um, APIs will tell you what you did wrong. And you can see that by actually going into the preview, um, or you can go straight into the response. So preview treats the response as some sort of web content, like HTML, SVG, and tries to render it. Um, response is just raw text response. And you can see that it actually returns invalid month. Um, this is probably a little bit irregular in real situations, you'll find that a lot of APIs and services return a JSON object or some sort of serializable object that gives you an error message or you know, maybe sometimes a link to like how to um, use the API correctly. Uh, but here you can see that the server did respond with invalid month. Um, but I do want to emphasize this because just from the console error, it, it's kind of not obvious. Um, it doesn't tell you why it failed. It just tells you that it failed. So you know, clicking through here will automatically open up the network tab, and then you can open it up and go to response and get some more information about this. Uh, yeah, initiate on the timing, we sort of already talked about. Um, you can also see all the cookies that were requested. Cool. So we know that it was an invalid month. So I look at ORC and I go, maybe that should be October, not ORC, shockingly. Um, so let me make that into October, save, and then refresh. Uh, cool, look at that gorgeous graph. 
Um, it almost looks like random data, doesn't it? But it's not, it's real data. Wait, October attendance 31. Oh, okay. So only four people came on the 25th of October. Ouch. All right. So yeah, so that sort of gives you a little bit of an understanding of how you can work with a network type a little bit when you have like failing resources. Um, another important thing that's worth talking is, let's talk about this graph, sorry, this table. This table is just a whole bunch of um, marks for students. Every student has an idea, you have students and you have the average that they are currently maintaining in the course. And you can see James had an F. Now, if I look at the raw file that this is representing students, um, I can edit it at will. Let's say that James emailed me the other day and gave me 50 bucks and that's all it really takes. Um, and now has an A. So I'm gonna now refresh the page and I think some of you might already be onto this. It has not updated. In fact, if I even refresh the specific refresh button, it doesn't update. But you can see in the notebook tab, maybe if I clear it, it is requesting the resource. So why is it not updating? Um, say in chat, I don't think this is a very hard one. Um, that's a good question. So sometimes the server has a static list of its files. So if you don't restart, it doesn't pick up on changes. Um, but in this case, I'm using a server that can pick up on that difference. Does anyone else want to have a crack? That is a good guess, though. That does happen sometimes. Yeah, disable cache. So the way that you can tell, yeah, we'll clear it. The way that you can tell that this is serving up a cached instance or a cached version of students is you open it up and you can see that it says from disk cache. So if you sort of, um, well, actually, if you refresh the page, you'll see that a bunch of these um, are sort of, they give you um, memory bytes or stuff like that. But you can see, oh, this one says memory cache, um, but this one says disk cache. Uh, the difference I imagine being that memory cache is um, stuff that's still in RAM that it can steal and use, whereas disk cache is stuff that's actually set to disk, so it'll sort of survive past uh, multiple reloads. But students is a disk cache, which means it's been cached. Now, the things you can look at once you've realized it's cached is one, what is its cache control? So you can see it says public max age 300, that's in seconds. So it means that um, the browser will not attempt to re-request this resource until 300 seconds have passed, which is, I don't know, four or five minutes, something along those lines. Um, 200 divided by 60, whatever that is. Uh, so it's not gonna request the resource again, so it's gonna have stale resources. Um, so how can you fix this? Uh, if you do want this sort of cache control in the production app um, and you don't wanna mess with it, you can um, do this little thing right here, disable cache, which disables it for as long as the netbook tab is open. If you close DevTools, it will re-enable the cache. Um, but as long as netbook uh, is open, you can disable the cache. And I think if I refresh now, it'll, uh, yeah, it'll update, see? Hey. Um, additionally, you can hard refresh. So when you refresh by default, it just reloads the page and it'll do the normal caching. A hard refresh um, for us, the browser to clear everything. Um, and the way I do this is Command Shift R instead of just Command R, um, Control Shift R on other computers. Um, there used to be a drop down menu from here that you could do it, but oh, hold. Oh, there is. There you go. You can also hard reload from here by holding down. That's weird. Anyway, I'm an empty cache and hard reload, stuff like that. Um, both of those work um, and sort of get you the result you want. Um, or you can also, obviously, if you think that this is the wrong caching sort of setup for your website, you can just disable, like remove the header. The browser will more or less respect the um, cache header. So it'll, it, if this wasn't here, it would just keep requesting it, right? So it's very useful to have caching, especially if you have a server that is maybe not the most powerful or is maybe quite expensive. So you wanna limit the amount of calls going to the server you can get some caching in. So um, less people are hitting your server per second. You have like a lower QPS um, queries per second. Um, so yeah, cool. Okay. And then the last thing is I have this detention lookup where if I type in, I don't know, James, it says James has zero detentions or Donald, nine detentions, Paul, Paul has nine detentions. Hopefully that's visible. Uh, is it visible? Yes, okay. Um, whoop, whoop. Cool. So the question is, if I type in James without a capital J, it doesn't work, right? Now, all of us being you know, smart computer science students um, or 
uh, similar sort of university students can figure out is probably because it's a case sensitive search, right? Because the name is another case. But let's say you couldn't, let's say you want to figure it out. So what you can do, uh, so this is sort of moving outside of the networking part of um, the lecture, but what you can do, right, is go into uh, the sources and try and find the code that calls this, right? So we're going to index.js. Um, maybe worth pointing out, if you use command P or I imagine control P, you get this little um, search bar, much like VS Code, if you're familiar with that, um, which lets you search files inside of um, your current sort of website. So I can type an index, it'll show me, it'll show me CSS files and stuff like that. Um, and also font files. Uh, and then if you go control shift P, it gives you a command palette. Again, very VS Code-like. Um, so you can sort of jump to different things. Like oh, if I want to show the network tab, I can jump over to it. So here I open up index and I'm going to look through and I found that detention lookup input on a input event, it calls this function called detention lookup. Um, now this function, I don't even know when it's defined. Um, and if I look through the rest of the file that actually it, it doesn't exist. Um, so I can probably go into elements and see that, oh, it's in its own file. Um, now that I've found the file, I'm going to try and open it up and you'll see that it's a minified file. Now, you can just do this and you'll see that it, um, the little button on the bottom left, the curly braces, will pretty print it. Um, usually that's not enough though. A lot of websites will further um, minify the code by replacing variable names. So I can say like E here is actually name in the source code, but it gets renamed to E because that's shorter and it reduces the total bundle size. Um, if you go to like google.com uh, inspect, you can see that, uh, let's go to like one of their JavaScript sources. Sure. You can see that if you try and pretty print this, it's all sort of capital Z, G, E, B, and you see they've done a lot of stuff that no reasonable coder would do. This is just because it gets minified, right? Um, but that's quite annoying, especially if you're trying to debug your code, right? So you'll see at the end that there's this little thing called source map URL. Um, you might actually see this in some production sites. Generally speaking, you'll see them in developer sort of developer environments the most. And this just says that this file, detention.min.js.map, contains all the information needed to map this compiled JavaScript file back to the original. So it is a real file. I think you can request it by doing that. The file format doesn't really matter. It's a it's like a you know special file format. It's a JSON file with a bunch of extra with a convention for how you can sort of generate these mappings. Um, you need to know how it works. What you need to know is that the browser will automatically see this magic comment and link it to. So if I search for detention, you'll see that I also have detention.js. Now this file doesn't exist. So if I go detention.js. Oh. Yep. Oop. It'll fail. There is no detention.js. This file has been generated by Chrome using the original file and the source map. So this file doesn't actually exist, but you can see, oh, it's, yeah, you can see that it has entry instead of E, and you can see that it's, you know, perfectly formatted and stuff. You will find that um, these sort of source map files also have comments where maybe the compiled one had all the comments stripped. It's just the original source file. Um, so now that I have this, I can maybe take a look and again, immediately tell, oh, this match function isn't doing a case insensitive match. Um, but let's say that you still haven't told, like figured that out yet. Um, you can set a breakpoint. You'll notice that it'll match, like it'll auto jump into the formatted file if you have one, but that's only if there is a formatted file. Um, otherwise, if you just set a breakpoint here, it'll, it'll just set a breakpoint. Um, realistically, what you've done is you've actually set a breakpoint at some column here but Chrome DevTools or whatever DevTools you're using um, will auto handle that. So I can set a, I can set a breakpoint and I can go, all right, um, you know, and you can see here that it's being called once for every entry per input. So every time I type in a letter, it will search um, that text input with all of these names and then we'll return whichever one matches first. Um, this is quite annoying, you can see that Every time I click forward, it immediately stops again because it goes into the next iteration of the loop, which is quite annoying. So I'm actually going to turn off this breakpoint, um, which I should be, there you go. You can do that here. Next, all right, that's not gonna work for me. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is right click, uh, enable, let's remove this breakpoint. 
it will not remove this breakpoint. Close. That's probably because I accidentally edited the file. Uh, cool. So right click add conditional breakpoint is quite useful. So in this point, it only breaks if a certain condition is met. Um, now, I think it's worth noting <laughs> that you actually can't use conditional breakpoints in source mapped files. It doesn't like it. You can see, you can tell that this is source map because it says at the bottom here. Um, but you actually, you can't really use conditional breakpoints because if you say, oh, name has to equal equal to James, it'll actually, it, it'll never run because you, uh, there is no name variable, right? Because um, this file doesn't exist. <laughs> There's no like real actual context running method. What you need to do in that case is actually jump back to the real file. Um, so you can still format this and we, we kind of have a mapping so you can kind of get away with it. Um, I was surprised by this. I, I almost want to say that maybe this is fixed in a future version of Chrome and I'm on an old version of Chrome, um, but I'm going to let you know just in case you can capture it. Um, most reliable way, go to the formatted version, which is the real code just sort of with white space added. Um, I'm going to put a conditional breakpoint here and say, if E is equal, equal, equal to James, uh, it should breakpoint. And then if I go ahead and say James, oh, it breakpoints the moment that um, that condition is true. And now I can debug. So the way that the um, debugger works in uh, Chrome DevTools, and I imagine in most other DevTools, is you can, once you have blocked, so once you have breakpointed in a context, you have access to any variable in that context. So at this point, I can hover over name and it'll tell me that this is capital J James, and I can cover over E and see that it tells me that it's lowercase James. We figured out the bug. Um, but aside from that, uh, any other variable in this context that is available if you were at this point in the code you know, yourself is all available and accessible from the console. So in the console, if I go n.name, you'll see that it actually pops up. Uh, and if I go e, it'll pop up. Um, at this point, you can actually like fuck with it. So if I wanted to say no, actually, the e you're comparing is actually now um, hula. It'll, that's it. Like it, it's worked. If you hover over E, it should be hula now. So you can actively change variables mid program um, and then continue with it and then see what happens. In this case, you'll see that it, um, it'll it keep going because the name James will keep getting passed into it. I'm just going to remove this. But then once you've done, you'll see no results found, um, which I mean, I guess would have happened anyway. Maybe if I do. James. So James has zero detentions, but this time I'm going to put the conditional breakpoint back in and say uh, E is equal to James. Cool. And then I'm going to go E is equal to hula. Cool. Okay. No results found, even though the James very much is in there, right? Since I paused it before I did the comparison and changed one of the variables, it doesn't exist anymore. So that's very powerful. It's quite useful to be able to stop your program in the middle of execution and then mess with variables. I will say that in a lot of ways, that is maybe the primary use case of actually bothering with the Chrome DevTools like whole experience. Generally speaking, if you just want to get more information about program state, you can do a pretty good job with just like a console log. Um, never underestimate the console log. But it is quite useful for cases like this when you want to stop. You actually don't know what variable you need to print. You can hover over all of them in the middle of the execution to see what's happening and even mess with some of them to see how your program reacts. Cool. All right. So I think that's that. Uh, the solution here would just be to make this a case insensitive check, not too interesting. Um, so the other stuff to show is um, let's look at this refresh button. So you've noticed that this pencil does a little, little animation. Um, there is a dedicated animations tab. Again, if I go control shift P and I search up animations, there'll be a little draw for it. Open. Um, so every time there's an animation on screen, you'll see that a little frame pops up. So the way to interpret this is these are all except like the different animations. They're grouped by um, their target, I believe. So if you do that, you can see that that's just the animation on the button. This one, I believe, is also on the button. And this one's also on the button. It's my little, oh. That's, there it is. Okay, cool. So this one is on the button and also on the 
did the pencil right. So if I press play, it will replay the animation. You might find that in the animations tab, this will be grayed out. That happens when the element that was animated is no longer in the DOM, so it can't be replayed. So sometimes what will happen is you'll like animate some element out, out of screen and then delete it. In this case, you can't actually replay it because the element doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, but for cases that it's still there, you can see that I can replay this as many times as I want. It's actually replaying all of the animations, including the one on the button. Cool. Uh, it tells you the current millisecond of the play. Um, and if I pause it, I should be able to drag this back. And then I can do sort of like a keyframe analysis and say, all right, so it does, does a little backflip up until this point and then this point out. Like that point looks a little bit weird because it's touching the button, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'll also see that this little graph it's showing you is the easing function. So um, I don't know whether it's worth going into easing functions. Maybe you've already um, had a chat about it in the CSS lectures. Um, but that is basically just how the animation progresses over time. Um, and you'll see that it's sort of, it's slower at the start and then faster at the end for the same time frequent, so for the same time. Um, it will also tell you what the name of the animation is. If it is a, um, a CSS animation that you defined via keyframes, it'll tell you what it's called. Otherwise, it'll actually just tell you what is being animated. Like here, you can see that border top color was being animated. Um, Cool. And if you double click on it, it shows you what element is being animated. So right here. Cool. So this is useful if you need to do some stuff. Um, you can also reduce the speed of the of the animation. So if I click it again, with all animations on the page reduced to 10% speed, see that it goes. Uh, what's happening? <gasps> oh, am I still paused? No, fine. Yeah, clear. <laughs> Refresh. There you go. Um, very slow animation. Painfully slow. Okay, so you can see that that sort of um, it slows down the animation, so you can have a, a closer look at it, and you can still play with it as needed. Cool. Um, any questions about whatever I talked about for the last half an hour? Cool. Okay. Um, so other stuff. Uh, what's new is not very interesting. It'll just tell you whatever happened in the last Chrome update. I think that's actually is Chrome specific. Um, search is useful. So if you go Control Command Shift F or Control Shift F, you'll open up. Oh, oh is it Command Control F now? Hmm. Well, regardless, you can do a search here. Um, this is a uh, universal search, so it'll search through all of your um, source files and all of your um, HTML files and stuff like that. So, you know, if you are looking for any reference to a specific term, like I'm going to trigger uh, event there, um, it'll sort of give you a breakdown. Okay, um, I won't go into sort of issues and stuff. Um, a lot of browsers will attempt to give you useful hints on how your website's doing and how you can make it better. Uh, they're mixed. Some of them are useful. Some of them aren't. Um, there are all automated tools, so you know they're never going to be as effective as you know someone who knows what they're doing, sort of going through your code. Um, so rely on code review there. Um, but the other stuff that's worth talking about is um, the layers panel. Okay. So occasionally, when you're working with like multiple elements that are z-indexed, that is that you have like multiple stacking contexts. Um, it gets a bit confusing uh, where things are and why they are rendering the way they are. So in these situations, you'll see that, let me just make this bigger. Um, there is a little layers tab. Again, you can get to it by doing layers or by this, more tools. Uh, I think layers is here. Um, this renders your, uh, renders your entire page into a 3D world where you can rotate and have a look at the layers. So the point of it is you can actually tell here that your pencil is actually in its own layer um, right here. Um, and you can, you can kind of get a feel for whatever, the, whatever this is. What is it? It's vertical scroll bar layer. OK. Oh, right, yeah, because I squished it to the side. OK. Um, so yeah, so you can see that multiple elements and each one of these graphs, for example, occupies its own layer. So you can click around with them and sort of get a, get a feeling for how many stacking contexts you have and how they relate to each other. Um, uh, you may be surprised that 
this um, pencil is for some reason in its own layer, like why would it need to be? We can see compositing reasons and it says that has an active accelerated transform animation or transition. Essentially what Chrome does is if something is animated, it pulls it into its own layer, which means that once we're sort of animating this pencil, we only need to affect that layer and you can kind of ignore the rest of the layers of the page, which is a massive performance boost. Uh, speaking of performance, oh yeah, so that's more or less all I want to bring up here. This is mostly useful for the cases where you have multiple Z indexes and you're sort of trying to get an idea of how they're stacked. Um, not too useful aside from that, at least in my experience, maybe someone else can have, someone else has like a lot more uses for it. Um, the other stuff is performance. So um, the performance is very useful for getting an idea on sort of specific um, bits of your program. You click record and then you do something and then you stop the recording and it basically profiles a bunch of stuff about your program. It tracks every event, every thread, um, every bit of sort of code that's running and it generates a report for you. So maybe I can, these are, they're a little bit CPU intensive. Let's just refresh, um, stop. Cool, okay. So you don't wanna run it for too long because the it generates a lot of data. So it starts to like take up like megabytes. Um, but you can see that it's a complex breakdown. It overlays your network information. So any network requests you made, uh, it also gives you a little frame by frame breakdown. Um, you can see the FPS at the bottom. Um, so over here it's 32 FPS, here it dropped down to eight because nothing's changing on the screen. Uh, and you can see this, this massive one FPS area of idle, again, because nothing was changing on screen. Um, and right here, this is your main JavaScript thread, it's called main. If you had service workers or web workers or stuff like that, they would occupy their own sort of section here. So you could tell them apart. This is the main thread and you'll see um, as I zoom in, it's you know massive and contains a lot of information. So here you can see that the summary will update depending on what section of your performance graph you're looking at. So you can see that we did some task. This was mostly the system was idle. So mostly idle, two milliseconds were spent in the system. So that's Chrome doing something. And then zero milliseconds were spent scripting, which is actually your JavaScript code being called. So you can see that this one was an animation frame fired. Uh, this is being handled by the chart library I used. You see this function call. And then as you drill down, you get more and more closer to bare metal. So you can see that by the end of this, this is mostly stuff like, you know, fill text uh, and more sort of lower level primitives. Um, and you can see these are spaced out that this is only happening once per um, animation frame. So you can see that they're happening regularly every animation frame. Um, and you can also, maybe this is more interesting, you can also see events. So this is a mouse move event, um, which happens every time you move a mouse, all those are tracked. Uh, and then you can see that the function, that a function was called in response to it. It was listening to that event. Um, yeah, so this is a lot of data. It's mostly because of so much data, that's why I say that you probably wanna like stick to analyzing small bits of your program of, of your website at a time. So you can sort of interpret it without uh, being overwhelmed. Um, and it's, it is mostly useful when you have a lot of interactive things and you're trying to figure out why is this slow? Why is this taking so long, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would say that this is maybe a little bit overkill for a lot of debugging cases. Instead, what I would do is you can open up the performance chart, a performance monitor, this thing. Um, this gives you just a live uh, breakdown of a bunch of stuff. Um, CPU usage obviously would, you'll see a jump up if you do a lot of like looping or JavaScript. Um, your JavaScript heap size, this is how much memory you have in JavaScript. If you create a lot of objects in JavaScript, you'll see that this begins to get bigger. Um, DOM nodes, how many uh, nodes are in your document. Event listeners, I think this is your active event listeners. So as you add and remove them, this should increase and decrease, I believe. Um, documents, you only have two, uh, which is interesting, should be one. I must have an iframe or something somewhere, uh, possibly. Um, and then layouts per second and style recaps per second. Um, so the reason why this is useful is as your program's running, uh, figuring out whether your CPU usage or your heap usage is sort of increasing gives you a hint as to what's going on. Um, and layout, layout per second and style recaps per second tell you if you're doing something that is uh, renderer heavy. So I think if I try and get this to animate, you'll see that the styles recalcs jump up to 10. Um, because it's doing a bunch of style recalculations. 
Um, it's actually not too bad because this is a CSS animation, so it's somewhat. Oh, sorry. So this is actually fine. It's actually just because it's probably retouching this again. Um, so you can see that that happens um, if I go over to my graph and then start hovering over things. Uh, style recalcs are. I can't see the summary anymore. Oh no, there it is. No, no, that's just the top. Oh, I guess I can see it there. Um, uh, sorry, cats. Not really. It's probably because it's actually not changing any layout or adjusting any styles. Um, all of these tooltips probably already exist in DOM and are just being turned on and off. But um, this is probably it, this is easy uh, to get to get a sort of a feel of sort of how the program is doing. Um, Actually, if I refresh it, I think that'll give you a, like a very noticeable spike in some stuff. So you can see that all of the event listeners are increasing um, to more than before for some reason. Oh, there you go. Now they're being reduced. Okay. Um, and then the DOM nodes and then the heap size, right? So you can see that it spiked for a bit right around about there because we were loading and doing things. The layout could be calculated a bunch as elements were added to the DOM um, in response to some JavaScript. Um, you can see the styles were also recalculated a bunch. So any questions about that? Cool. All right. Um, now the other stuff that's interesting to know about is the rendering tab. Um, I mostly say this because a lot of um, a lot of people are thinking about dark mode and light mode these days. It's kind of a hot craze is every app needs to have a light mode and a dark mode. Um, the way that you do that uh, conventionally in web is you use uh, a CSS selector. Yeah. Uh, you can listen to a media query that says, is the preferred color scheme dark? And then change the background to dark. Sorry, black, let's say in this case. You can actually run any arbitrary CSS here. Um, and you'll see that this will actually turn black now because my Mac is set to dark mode. So what happens is every, like your operating system will have some like idea whether it's in light or dark mode. I think in Mac, it's like in settings, you can find it. Ah, system preferences, dark mode, appearance. Yeah, light, dark, auto. Um, so your website can detect that your operating system is in dark mode and then change. Uh, but you can also in this little thing, um, I mean, let's CSS media prefers color scheme. You can force into light mode uh, or back into dark mode. Uh, there's also other media emulation, like you can emulate how your website would look when it's being requested into print view. So this is what the browser does before you print anything, like print a website. Um, and then there's also the, so prefer, prefers reduced motion is an accessibility thing where you can detect if a user has asked you to use less animations because they're like seizure sensitive. Um, and that's great. I will say that um, it is very new. Like I haven't seen a lot of websites use it. It would be good if more websites use it. Um, so generally speaking, this should turn off animations and make the page a little bit more static. Um, and then a whole bunch of color stuff. And you can also emulate sort of like, what does the website look if I have um, some level of color blindness? So you can you know double check that if you're building a website that requires you know sort of the only way to tell whether something is good or bad is whether it's green or red that you can sort of still tell. Um, it's all very useful. And there's a bunch of other stuff that you can do, stuff like layer bonus and frame rendering stats. I think this actually plots yeah, a little thing at the top so you can check how the FPS of the website's going as you sort of do various things. Um, cool. Okay. So I think with that, I just had one or two more things to talk about. One is that um, very recently, DevTools released a new version and they now have a, this concept of recorded flows. What's the official name they're called? Yeah, recorded user flow. They had like a very nice, like, yeah, there you go. So you can see that um, you can create a flow and essentially, if anyone's worked with Microsoft Excel, I think Excel does this as well. It calls it like, I don't know, recorded macros or something. Um, it You click record, you do a bunch of stuff and it'll record everything you did. And then it, it generates a sort of um, user story, essentially. So you can uh, check the performance of it, you know, mess with it, and you can sort of get a feel for how your website interacts with this sort of specific user case. Um, it's only in Chrome M97, uh, but I, I want to bring it up because it is very cool. And I found out about the other day and I want to talk about it. So um, I want to talk on that. So that's also quite useful, especially if you are building a website for a client who sort of gives you some sort of requirement that a you know, core user flow can't take more than five seconds. There's 
a lot of interesting studies that say if you have like a checkout cart process, like every step you add to that process reduces the number of people who will buy your product. You want to make it as like as one click as possible. Um, so, you know, I guess people don't think about it too much and, you know, change their minds. You want to like get the money into your account as fast as possible. I don't know whether that's ethical or not, but um, it is a requirement. So you might, you know, you'll find this useful to do stuff like that. Uh, cool. I think that's it. Here's my little cheat sheet. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, let me talk about one more thing and then I'll let you go to talk about the assignment is um, this little tab called the application tab is all about PWAs. Um, how much have we talked about sort of installable web apps in this course? Can someone yell? Can I, can I get a um, not at all somewhat weird expert? No. Okay. So um, something that uh, Google in particular is pushing quite hard uh, is this concept of an installable web app. So if your um, website could run offline as is, um, Chrome wants to give you, oh, a lot of apps and browsers actually, want to give you a way to install the app so it, it behaves like a real app. So you've probably heard of Electron. So I think like Slack and Discord and stuff are both examples of Electron. But uh, the idea is that we cut out that middleman, that you don't need a sort of application layer wrapping a website. You can just install the website and it'll still run on Chrome, but act and behave more like a real website. Um, it's very useful because it means that you can build a website and not have to build like an Android app or a Mac app or a desktop app. Um, can you do this with every class of app? Not yet. Uh, obviously web is missing a lot of web APIs and they're very hesitant to add them because uh, web security is a big issue. Like you can't, for example, from a website access your file base. So making like a web-based code editor is quite difficult because you would have to first give it access to all of your you know, files so you can like read them. And every time you open up a new folder, you need to give it permission to open that folder and stuff like that. And it also doesn't get notified when the files on disk change, you know? Um, so, Yes, the, the point is, is that in application, um, it kind of gives you a whole bunch of stuff uh, related to trying to make your website a PWA or like a installable application. So PWA stands for progressive web app. So all the sort of features that Chrome gives you to try and make your website more sort of native is it gives you a API to store um, things locally. So in JavaScript, you can say, hey, save this, you know, X, Y, Z, and it'll stay, um, stay in that little local storage area until you remove it or until the user force clears it. Um, this is useful if you want to save some data across multiple sessions, across multiple days, years, months. Uh, so some stories, IndexedDB, WebSQL, these are all things to try and sort of give you some sort of persistent storage as a website, um, which doesn't rely on a server. Um, and sort of background services as well. Background fetch and background sync and notifications and stuff are all targeting that sort of field of oh, I want a website to be able to notify its users even when it's not open. So this sort of stuff lets a website do that. Again, trying to bridge that gap so a website can act more like a real app. Your manifest is most useful. The manifest is essentially how you opt into this. You say, here's a manifest.json. You know, this means that this app can be installed and here's sort of what it should be called and what the icon should be. Um, and then once you have a manifest.json, it'll give you more helpful hints. So like, you're missing this, you're missing this, right? Um, yeah and then service workers as well, which is, um, it helps you write a middle layer between your application and the server, um, and it lets you cache things. So it essentially helps you make a website that runs offline, um, more or less. I'm not gonna go into more detail because PWAs are very complicated and there's like a whole whole thing there, but it's worth knowing that A, they exist um, and they're quite cool if you wanna build like an app and not have to sort of leave web land, um, that is possible and you can do it without having to sort of use Electron. Um, it's not perfect for every use case, but it's there. Um, and application is your, is your friend. It'll sort of help you debug a lot of the things to do with trying to make an app that runs offline. Cool. Yeah. Oh, and Lighthouse will generate a bunch of reports on how good your app is. Again, it's, it's, it's okay. It's better than nothing. It gives you like good pointers on sort of whether you are a progressive web app, um, what your performance and stuff is, but uh, it, it's not as good as sort of, you know, just reading up on stuff and sort of take, having some due diligence. Cool, I'm done. Does anyone have any last questions for Zane? How oh, this isn't related. I was just reading this. It was a comparison of all of the different libraries. Preact is beating everything in terms of Lighthouse Square and PageRate. Anyway. Huh.
There you go. Yeah. Does Google, is there a popular declarative framework within Google? Like, yeah. Is, is it Angular? Isn't Angular Google's? Angular is Google's, but um, Angular is old school. Don't you know? But well, isn't like Angular 2 or something now? Or Angular 2 also was a thing. I think Angular 3 was a thing. Um, but these days, we the, the new hot thing is lead elements, um, which are a, it's like a small wrapper of a web component, and it does a lot of what you'd expect React and Vue and stuff to do. Um, I quite like them. Is personally. it lightweight? It looks, seems lightweight. It is. It's a little bit, um, it's actually a significant bit lighter than React. So it's, it's yeah. Yeah, cool. There you go. If you're curious, that's there. There you go. Lit element. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Zane. Um, it's definitely, I think it's the most, it's one of the more like kind of interacting and in-depth lectures um, that we do this term. So feel free to, feel free to bumble your way off. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions for Zane, I'd probably recommend uh, emailing me because I can forward them on. Um, if you post on, or you can post on the forum actually, because I can just add Zane to the forum. Anyway, just put it into the ether somewhere in my general direction and we'll figure it all out. Um, and yeah. thanks again, Zane. Are you going to head off now or are you hanging around and listening to nothing? <laughs> um, I'm going to head off because I have been working since night. Um, yeah. But have a great time. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, shoot me an email if, anyone, if anything was confusing. Okay. Thanks so much, Zane. Cool. Um, so, great. I might hit stop recording and then I might hit start recording.